Loved ones, today is session 11 for Management 3234. If we were meeting face to face, it would be 6 July. Um, I want to mention just one thing administratively. It's not a big deal, but our next class is going to be a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to make a presentation to you about business models. And of course, the presentation is on Folio. The only reason I'm sharing that with you as an admin thought is across my career, many of my students have told me that they like some sort of a heads up if we're gonna do a PowerPoint thing because they their preference is to print it like two to the page, three to the page, so that they can make notes contemporaneously with the presentation. You have no obligation to do that. But I just wanted to tell you that our next time together is uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation on business models. So today is chapter a discussion of chapter eight which is the textual discussion of business models. And there's a lot of good content there. I want to start with something, though, that, that I really consider to be very foundational. If you've had a chance to read the chapter, you would know that a big piece of business models deals with the whole concept of value. And, and value is a duality. Uh, if you're in business, you have to create value for you, for your organization, but you also must create value for the customers whom you serve. If you don't, they don't buy your stuff. So value is a very, very big deal. And, and I want you to understand that because I, <laughs> if you or I, in an organizational context, make a decision and that decision doesn't add value, we're dumber than rocks. Why would you ever do that? Why would you, we ever make a decision that doesn't add value? So the point is this is, when I say foundational, I mean that sincerely. So what I want to do is I want to put, um, I want to sort of develop the concept of value on the board um, before, before we jump into chapter eight. So I want to start by giving credit to a really neat guy, a man named Carl Vesper. He was an entrepreneurship scholar, um, had a distinguished career, probably retired just a few years ago somewhere in Seattle. I hope he's not in the chop zone, but who knows? Seattle people are not my people. So here's how Vesper, Carl Vesper, this is his definition of value. Carl argues that value is the relationship between price and performance. Well, I get that. The relationship between price and performance. Now, I want to show you an example that, that I think sort of captures this. And I want to develop a, a quick contrast. So let me just, let me tell you sort of anecdotally, probably 30 years ago or so, I realized that Michelin tires were nothing short of extraordinary. I put them, at, I, I, I special order, order them in all of our new vehicles. I put them on as aftermarket stuff. I put them on our lawnmower if they were available in that size. The primary reason that I like Michelin's is they are designed and manufactured to have extreme, extreme service life. And, and, and of course, that sort of matches up with my value proposition. There are other reasons, like, like the Pilot Sport Series are on all high-performance cars, uh, the 911 Porsches, the Shelbys, uh, a lot of racers, a lot of people who race GT cars, race on Pilot Sports. So although Michelin has a variety of tires that do a variety of things, it bakes into the tire, in both in, in the, the design and in the manufacturer extreme service life. So let me tell you what I discovered about well, it wouldn't be forever ago, maybe uh, 19 years ago or so. In 02, I bought a, a, a Ford F-350, a one-ton truck, and it came with Firestones, and I took one trip in it, and I was terrified. I drove in a rainstorm, and I had a trailer on, and it was like a, a, like a mechanical rodeo for about a 1,000 miles. So when I got back to town, back to my hometown, I went to the, Michel to the uh, Ford dealership, and walked into the owner's desk and dropped my checkbook on the counter and said, please, put four Michelins on that truck. So, I got four Michelins on my F-350, and the first set of Michelins lasted 120,000 miles. I put a second set on, 120,000 miles. I was on the third set, and I, I sold the truck at about 320, and, and I bought a new um, an F-150, which, of course, has Michelins on it, just like my daughter's Edge, and my wife's Lincoln, and every other road worthy vehicle that we have. So here's this value proposition with Bill Norton's Michelin tires on a pickup truck. This thing about price and performance, 
I spend a thousand dollars for a set of four tires and I get 120,000 miles of service life. So that is what I've discovered is sort of matches up with my value uh, proposition. I have a brother-in-law, John, whom I love dearly. Uh, John has a tattoo, a Chevy bow tie on his butt. Do not ask me how I know unless you want to come to one of our family reunions. Well, John, for all the wonderful things he is, is just tighter than bark when it comes to money. And, and uh, John recently, not too long ago, said, he called me up and said, Danny, I just bought me four new tires at Pet Boys, $300. And I said, well, good, I'm glad. Well, a few months later, he called me back and said, Billy, them some bitches only lasted 10,000 miles. So, my brother-in-law, John, bought a set of tires, and he spent 300 bucks, and he got 10,000 miles worth of service out of them. So, I'm not smart, special, important. I simply have a different value proposition than John does. But if you look at this from through my eyes, how many sets of tires is John going to buy to go 120,000 miles? Unless I embarrass myself, 12. And 12 times 300 is $3,600. So my point is that I think this simple tire thing does a pretty good job of demonstrating Carl Vesper's definition. Value is the relationship between price and performance. Now, to be sure, Oftentimes, performance is not measurable just by a single metric. Now, there are so many things that, 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 that fold into performance, but if you grasp the concept, if you get Vesper's definition, value is defined as a relationship between price and performance. And every one of us has our own value propositions. But I just thought that that was this notion of showing, sharing with you Vesper's definition of value and giving you one working example would be helpful. The, the thing that I want to say, and this is the reason I wanted to talk about value before we rolled into the discussion in chapter eight, where we talked about business models and a lot of related things. The uh, value is a recurring theme in every business decision, really. I'll circle back to what I said a few minutes ago. If, if we purposely do something that doesn't add value, we're stupid. Why did we do that? Why do we engage in some behavior and spend money, incur costs, if it didn't add value? So value, when I, when I say it, it's foundational to business, I really mean that sincerely. And again, I thought, I thought this would be time well spent. So now, uh, I have to do the attendance verification story. I had the extreme good fortune to be on the faculty at the University of Louisville for seven years. And when I joined that faculty, we had a wonderful guy as a dean, Bob Taylor, retired Air Force officer, great, great guy. And uh, Bob retired while I was there. And we got a new dean. Our new dean was a guy named Charlie Moyer. He came to us from Wake Forest. And uh, shortly after Charlie joined us, he told us a fun story at a faculty meeting. Uh, I can't remember what town Wake Forest is in. I think it might be Winston-Salem, but it's somewhere in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. And one of the local newspapers in, in, in the community that, that sort of supports Wake Forest had uh, some sort of a contest. And the contest revolved around subscribers, readers, nominating new words, words that they were original creations, they were novel, they hadn't been used or, 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 uh, or even, even identified in other contexts. So the story that Charlie told us was that one of his MBA students at the time, excuse me, won the contest, and he won the contest with a word I'm gonna put on the board, very, very straightforward. The word is Buron, B-U-R-O-N. And the reason this kid won the contest for new words with that word Buron is at the time, nobody had ever heard of it. It was not in common usage. And his, his uh, contribution, the word Buron, was a mashup and a truncation of two words, bureaucratic moron. How 
cool is that? How cool is that? So that I just want to share that with you. That will that will become. Um, we'll talk about that later in the in the session. So now let me jump on chapter eight. I'm in chapter eight of the text, and. Uh, I hope my notes are right. Page 203, I believe that the authors define business model, and, and it is so simplistic. They define a business model as a framework that creates, delivers, and captures value. Now, this notion about capturing value means that the company has to, whatever it does, has to add value to the company, and the deliver piece says that you have to deliver value to the segments, to the customer groups that you serve, because if you don't, Nobody buys your stuff. So, simple, powerful definition. A business model is defined as a framework that creates, delivers, and captures value. Now, it's fair to say, and the authors point this out, that that is an essential feature of organizational renewal. Because if we don't constantly renew our organization, whether it's structural products, segments, technology, if we don't engage in organizational renewal, at some point we become irrelevant. Um, I, I'm not sure that anybody makes electric typewriters anymore. Gosh, we've had, we've had, uh, my first computer when I was practicing as a CPA, we could not buy, we had to lease, it was an IBM system, was it a system 34? It was a relatively big mini computer wasn't a desktop. Uh, and, and the lease, the capitalized lease value, this is in 19, would have been in 1977. The capitalized lease value was $77,000. It wasn't nearly as good as the $1,500 laptop that probably most of you have today. But my point is that, that if a company does not engage in organizational renewal, it becomes irrelevant. And, and so, so this notion about a business model how do we create, deliver, and capture value? Um, the, the reason this thing about renewal is so significant is a company's past successes have almost no predictive value for the company's future success. There are so many firms that have just been top of the mountain at a moment in time and then neglected to engage in renewal. They did not discern what their customers' value propositions were. They didn't clearly look for a way to create value and capture for themselves. They just kept doing the same old stuff. And, and I can assure you, firms that don't engage in renewal. I'm not saying that, there are a lot of products that are very durable. Uh, I don't know when the first bolt action rifle was invented, but the first one that was adopted by the military was in, in the late 19th century, probably uh, 1892 or so. Uh, a German named Mauser, developed a bolt action rifle that the German military adopted. So 1892, 2020, big, big gap of years, and we still have functional bolt action rifles. They're used in hunting, in the military, in competition, in law enforcement. So my point is some products are very durable, but think about this. Have, have uh, current production rifles, do they have better trigger systems, better safety systems? Is there better quality of machining? the barrel, the receiver, that sort of thing. Is there better fitment with whatever stock system, whether it's wood or composite or aluminum chassis? Uh, do we have better metallurgy? Uh, my point is that some products are very, very durable across time, but uh, inevitably they will be improved, inevitably. So past success, as I say, rarely, if ever, predicts future success. Firms have to engage in organizational renewal, and this notion of, of discerning value. What can we do to capture value for us? How can we have revenues reliably exceed costs? What can we do to deliver products or services to customers that they perceive as adding value? Now, um, the authors go on, they start on page 206, and they say that there are four core areas of a business model, and I'm just gonna discuss them in the order that they're presented in the text. The first thing that they talk about that would be a central piece of a business model is does the offering include a value proposition for the customer? Not for you, not for the entity, not for the organization that's delivering. 
but does the value, whatever it is you're bringing to the market, does that offering match up with a customer's value proposition? And, and then, of course, in that section, it, it talks about things which we'll visit again later. It, what segments do you serve? Are you just serving the community of nurses? Are you serving auto mechanics? Are you serving college students? Are you in food service? You know, which means that, that likely you could, you could uh, potentially attract almost anyone, uh, unless they're vegan. They eat rocks and roots, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Um, how do you reach these segments? How do you reach them? Social media? Do you buy advertisements in periodicals, glossy print magazines? Do you have big newspaper, I mean newspaper, forgive me, television ads? Do you direct mail? Do you have samples in stores? Do you attend trade shows? Uh, do you do a lot of... Uh, promotional sort of stuff. Like for example, you sponsor a 5K where the proceeds go to charity, but you're clearly the sponsor and the, the people who participate know that you were the driving force behind it. How do you reach the segments that you want to serve? Uh, clearly, uh, and, and then of course the critical question that you have to answer when you have to struggle with this thing about does our offering deliver a value proposition? You have to discern the value proposition for the customers. Um, how do they perceive it? And I'll talk about some of the things that are potential solutions, some of the things a little bit later that, that I think address that question. So the first of the four core areas of the business model is, does the offering literally deliver value to the customer? Big, big stuff. The second question talks about the customers. Uh, and again, this is a very clear crossover with some of the things I just raised. Who is in the segment? How are they reached? Now we're going to talk about a little bit later in this chapter about the customer value proposition and inevitably there'll be some overlap and that isn't bad. So the third thing that we talk about when we talk about um, a business model, infrastructure. What resources does it take to manufacture this product, to deliver it, to deliver service? And resources are much more than I mean, there, there are a lot of net-based businesses that are simply resellers, would you agree? Uh, oftentimes they will drop ship. They'll post something on a website, you order it, and they send instructions to whoever the manufacturer is, the manufacturer drop ships it to you. Um, th that is utter simplicity. Um, there are people who become millionaires by taking gallons of stuff. They'll buy in 55 gallon drums and they sell it in one ounce bottles. Can you say perfume? A lot of perfumes are 60, 70 bucks an ounce. And I can promise you they cost nothing to make. Pancakes. How much do you think IHOP has in a pancake? Right? Eggs, flour, a little bit of oil, a little bit of milk. What do you think a pancake costs? A quarter? Maybe? I'd be surprised if it costs that much. Pizza. One of the reasons why there are 50 jillion pizza parlors in this country is one, we like that round pie, many of us do. But, but the point is, it, it's incredibly profitable because the costs are so low. So the point is, the thing about infrastructure, what does it take to deliver products and services? If I have a restaurant, do I have to have a delivery function? But do I have to have my own drivers? Can I use DoorDash or Postmates or Uber Eats or whatever the case may be? And the answer is that I might have to. Think about the, the significance of food delivery in, in this COVID situation that we've endured for several months now. Uh, awful lot of people are getting food delivered to them. I've got a friend that owns a number of convenience stores and, and this surprises me, but perhaps it shouldn't. He says that regularly delivery drivers for food services will pull in his convenience stores and, and they will buy an 89 cent 32 ounce soft drink, like at say a Parker's, or he is not, he's not Ray Parker, but uh, they'll, buy, they'll buy an 89 cent soft drink with ice, and of course they charge the person to whom they deliver it five bucks. And whether the driver gets tipped or not is a, an individual sort of a decision. But my point is that there's an, an what does it take? Uh, in, in the case of food, do you, do you make it, bake it, or take it? Uh, do you have to have a delivery function? There are a lot of restaurants that really don't do that. They may offer a takeout menu, but they, they have no interest in the delivery function. So my point is, and we don't need to worry about restaurants. Um, what, if you're, what if you're a net-based business? You could be a retailer, you could be an information provider. What if you are a service business? 
What if you decide to repair ATVs or lawnmowers or you're a gunsmith or whatever the case may be? What, it, what resources does it take for you to deliver those services or, or to manufacture and distribute those products? And then the fourth thing that, that is one of these core areas of, the, uh, of a business model is what is the financial viability of your concept? Um, I told you that value has a duality. The business has to capture value. It has to have revenues that exceed costs. It simply has to make a profit. And of course, the other piece of that, the other duality piece is that you have to discern the value proposition of your customers and match it or exceed it. Well, this is the point where we're talking about the business. We started this, the first of the four core areas was how does the offering deliver value to the customer? And we're finishing it with how does this product offering or service offering deliver value to the business? Is this business viable on a regular basis? Will our revenues exceed our costs? Because they must. So those are the four core areas that the authors talk about. Um, now I'm on 207 and the authors talk about uh, a concept that they call the customer value proposition. We've spoken of it in just the last few moments. It has incredible significance. Um, and, and the questions that they ask, that the authors pose here, I think are pretty revealing. The first is, it's comparative you with your competitors. What do you do? How does your business offer a greater value, more value than your competitors? What, what if I sold the same stuff other people did, but I had better hours? or longer warranty, or more talented technicians to repair stuff. There's so many ways you can add value. Um, how does your business offer more value than competitors? And clearly, what that means is that you've got to do sufficient research to know what your competitors' offerings are. You have to have a really keen sense for what your competitors are doing because you have to beat them. Because if they offer a better package, a better bundle than you do, you know precisely where the customers are going. So that's the first thing. How do you offer more value to your competitors? Um, the, the next is, how would you sustain it over time? It, to be sure, there are, some, there are some industries, some products that have an incredibly long life cycle. Um, nothing has happened and there's still spirits in 60, 80 years. Nothing has significantly happened in rail freight in that long. Nothing has happened in forest products. There have been no major innovations in the airline industry for decades. We still put people in an aluminum cylinder, jet engines lift them, take them where they're going, and you land. Um, so the point is that, that there are many industry sectors that, that have not advanced technologically. They, they really, that is not bad. I mean, growing a tree and felling it and making lumber or paper products out of it is a pretty straightforward concept. But uh, how does one, how does a business sustain this customer value proposition across time? I would argue that that's a tough question to answer. And the only way you could do it is to have a direct connection with, uh, with people in your customer base and, and find out what pleases them, what disappoints them, what they would like to see. Is there any emergent tech that would influence what you're doing? There is no, there are no shortcuts. If you, if you do not have touches, direct, regular interaction with your customers, you're not going to know what their value proposition is because it is inevitable that it will shift. Look at, um, look at the needs of you as a single person. So you get a great job, you buy a new car, you live in an apartment, all right, now you marry and have children. Uh-huh, that's right, we've had. So now you've got a bunch of short kids. You're gonna be living in an apartment in Buckhead if you're in Atlanta, and you are not. You're gonna be buying a three or four bedroom home somewhere in the suburbs. That means lawnmowers and all kinds of stuff like that. That means two vehicles, and at least one of them has to be a competent family vehicle. Four doors, lots of seats, cargo area, that sort of stuff. Because now you're toting short kids around, along with you and mama. You're also gonna need daycare. You're probably gonna eat out more, whether it's takeout or fast food or whatever. My point is, in a 10-year window from, say, 22 to 32, your needs to support your family unit will change radically in that 10 year period. Transportation, housing, food, daycare. My goodness. So, 
how do, the only way I think that you can answer that question, how do you sustain a customer value proposition against time, is having this, this regular direct interaction with people in your customer group. And you must actively engage, you must find out what their needs are, if they're evolving, if they're well pleased with what you're doing. Uh, so again, um, this customer value proposition is a big deal. And I know that this chapter focuses on it significantly because that's the central feature of any business model. In fact, we're going to talk about business models in, in, in much greater, much more of an expanded perspective. But I want you to understand that you can almost synthesize a business model down to answering two questions. Am I delivering value to my customer group? Are we capturing value for the business? If you can deliver value to the segments that you serve and simultaneously make a profit, you have the, the makings of a solid business model. I mean, I, I get it that it's more complex and we'll talk about a lot of other attributes of it, but I'm really serious. You can synthesize a business model down to those two features. What are we doing that delivers value to the customer group? What are we doing to capture value for us? If you can, if you can answer those two questions affirmatively, you have, you have a functional business model right there. So now, <clears throat> I told you that it's sometimes hard to discern what, what makes, uh, what creates value for anyone in any customer group. So one of the things that the authors talk about, I'm on 209 right now, they talk about classic problems experienced by customers. So how about lack of time? Are you kidding me? How many people do you think have engaged other companies to, to uh, lawn services to cut their grass? Because they lack time. Um, lack of money. I need to say much more there. Um, There's so many things that we might like to do, but we are constrained. The third thing, lack of skills. I am um, competent. If you put a wrench in my hands, because I'm very, very comfortable with mechanical things. I, I built race cars for seven years, and my cars literally won three championships in two different cars in two different classes. That's a, that's, a, that's a modest success, isn't it? So my point is I'm competent in that domain, but I'm only strong mechanically. I don't do body work. If the car got wrecked, I'm not a welder. Um, I'm, I'm not very strong electronically. There are those of you who would love to, to plug up a laptop to an OBD port, an onboard diagnostic port, and, and read lines of code and change them, and you can do that. I don't. Those are not my strengths. So if I need something electronically, I'll find someone who possesses those skills because I don't. Can I do my own root canals? Heck no. Well, actually I could, couldn't I? I've got a cordless driver at home and I get a bottle of whiskey. And see, the whiskey is both the anesthesia, I'll get stupid fast, and the antiseptic. So I could get all liquored up and then drill that root canal out, couldn't I? I could do my own root canal. I'm thinking no. I'm thinking no. Lack of time, lack of money, lack of skills. And, and they, they talk about something that it's vague and, and I get that. Lack of access. Um, when I say that's vague, access to me, think about this. You're a retailer. I'm going to make something up very, very simple. You're a, you, um, you're in the food service industry and you develop a new mech chip. You have your own recipe, I think that's wonderful. So you buy equipment, you make the chips, you bag them, you've got them labeled and everything else. So now, don't you have access to, don't you have to get access to distribution channels? Are you gonna send your mech chips online? I don't think that's likely. You can do it perhaps, but I don't see some, I don't see great success there. So this thing about lack of access, in this context, you need access to a distribution channel. What if I got some big food distribution company to uh, carry my line of mixed chips? I went to Cisco or, or uh, Seabreeze or, or US Foods or some of the others, and they took my product and distributed it to restaurants and cafeterias all over the nation. What if I got in a retail store, any grocery store, uh, Albertsons, Safeway, Walmart, whatever the case may be, 
Kay Roger. It's not Kroger, y'all look at the sign, Kay Roger. So the thing about lack of access, I, we're typically not gonna be denied information because there is so much high quality information available at our fingertips, literally. And we may have to be diligent in the search process, but lack of access, oftentimes, I think the best, uh, the best way of describing it is, is uh, access to channels. How do I get in somebody's supply chain? so that I can get my product out. That would be true with anything. You could, uh, you could be a clothier, you could make men's shirts, or you could, uh, you could be a, a fashion designer. There is a great example. Uh, we, have, we have fashion design and merchandising as majors on this campus. So if you go down that path, how do you get your designs and your merchandise sold? How do you find distribution channels? Do you go to boutiques? Do you get uh, uh, Nord, what's that fancy place? Nordstrom, no, whatever it is, Macy's. Uh, not very fancy, am I? I mean, I buy my blue jeans at Tractor Supply. Not, uh, not exactly a Maxinista. Um, so the point is, the reason the authors talk about classic problems that customers experience, lack of time, lack of money, lack of skill, lack of access, can your concept solve any of those problems? Because if it does, you are creating value for some customer group. Hallelujah. So the point is, that's, that's almost a jump start. If you can look at those four simple dimensions of think, ah, how can I solve that problem? If you have a solution, your solution likely will create value for some significant customer group. Now, they, uh, I'm on uh, 212, 213 now. <clears throat> Excuse me, the authors talk about three types of value propositions. And I'm not sure that we are limited to these three, but I think this is a good starting point. They say the first thing, the first type of value proposition would be the benefits of the value proposition all flow from the product. The product has features or attributes. Uh, for example, there are some people who buy run-flat tires. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't because I've ridden in cars and driven cars that have them, and they handle terribly. Because to have a run-flat tire means that you have to have sidewalls that are incredibly stiff. Sidewalls of a tire, your tires are a huge part of the suspension system of your car. The rubber tires, because they're pneumatic, they have air in them, they absorb shocks. And if you watch the tire under load, you'll see that the sidewalls flex. I can promise you from years on road courses that, that sidewall characteristics are probably the single most important of any race tire, much more so than, than compound or tread patterns or anything else. So the characteristics of the sidewalls flexing. So run flats have very stiff sidewalls because they are meant to remain stiff even if the tire you loses air. Well, my point is that there are people who will pay big money for run-flat tires, and I get it. I'm not one of them. But my point is, one type of value proposition is the benefits flow from the attributes of the product, whatever the product is. A second type of value proposition that you can create is a focus, you, you create a value proposition for anyone if you can look at your competition comparatively and you do something that differentiates you. For example, I'm not going to do this, but I would be very comfortable opening up a bike shop in the Walmart parking lot. And of course, there's some people that say, were you dropped on your head as a child? And I would say, I'm not sure. My mom's dead. We can't ask anybody. But my point is, Here's my take on Walmart and bicycles. Walmart sells inexpensive bicycles that are primarily meant for youth, for kids that are still growing. And there's no way I could touch them in terms of me being able to offer identical bicycles for the same price. Walmart could just whip me like a rented mule. However, I wouldn't compete directly with Walmart. I'd sell mid-range bikes, probably in the four to $600 range, cruisers, that sort of stuff. And I would sell bikes that serious cyclists buy. You know, all the fancy stuff, titanium frames and, and uh, cranks and, and, and all the exotic stuff. I have a friend and colleague who's a crazy biker. I mean, he wears his little Tour de France yellow shirt when he rides to school 
and he has a little clicky shoes and he rolls the bike into the elevator, goes to his office and changes. I wonder if he has a shower in his office. He's an econ guy, <laughs> who knows? But my point is that he has an $11,000 bicycle, okay? I promise you, I could open a bike shop in, in the Walmart parking lot and whip them because I would not sell bikes in, in the same price points, the same features, the same attributes. I would offer service, trade-ins, warranty repairs. I could do all sorts of stuff that Walmart couldn't dream of. So I'm certain that I could open a bicycle shop in a Walmart parking lot and be incredibly successful because my point is that I would differentiate myself from this major competitor. So that's a legitimate basis for value proposition. How do you differ? How do you differ from the people who are your direct competitors? And then the last, the last type of value proposition, they use a term that, that I struggle with because I, I don't know its origin and I don't really understand the application. They talk about a resonating focus. Stop making stuff up. What they're saying is in that type of value proposition, the customer is at the center. But the reason I'm struggling with that is Everything about value propositions looks at the customer because if, I, if I'm selling anything and you're a potential customer and I don't meet your value propositions, I don't get any of your money. So I don't, I don't really understand the customer at the center. I don't. And I, I apologize for that. I wish I, wish my, I wish I had more bandwidth. I wish I was smarter. So two of them are abundantly clear to me. The third, much less so. So I bet you guessed I'm not going to ask you to write an essay question about that. Hmm? Just a guess. So now there's a discussion on 215 and it's the business model canvas. And I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation to you at our next class meeting. So we're blowing that off today. There's no reason to. I have an entire class session set aside for the business model canvas. So loved ones, I know it's heartbreaking this video session is coming to a close, and I have to ask you, <laughs> just looked in the camera. I have to ask you to send me an email and tell me what the word was that that Wake Forest MBA student created that won the local newspaper competition. All right, love you. I'll be back with you soon.